Well, thank you, Nikos, and um, for inviting me to present here at ICRAX. Uh, this talk, just to, as a disclaimer, this talk is intended for a general audience. We were hoping that there would be, you know, high school students, et cetera, here. So if you're ICRA attendees, this, you know, might not be the talk for you. But what I wanted to talk to, to you about today is to explain to you a little bit about how we manage to control and plan for the motions of robots. And one of the kind of amazing things about these techniques that we use for doing this is the same techniques that we use to plan for a robot, we can also use to plan for things like digital characters in, a, in an animation or in a film, as well as for proteins. So what I'm gonna start off with just giving you some examples of the different types of motion planning problems that we can plan for. And then I'll tell you um, how we do that. So what we have here first, this, this uh, animation that's moving, this is a problem we call the alpha puzzle problem. And that's one of these tricky benchmark problems that we solve, that we motion planners try to solve. If you are familiar with this, this is a twisted nail problem. And if you know how to solve it, it's really simple. If you know particular that configuration, once you know that, you can separate these tubes. But otherwise, it's hard. And imagine trying to design a computer program that would discover that particular configuration or small set of configurations on its own. So the basic motion planning problem is you're given some movable object, um, in this example here, this rod, and you have some goal, start and goal configurations, and you want to plan how to take it from that start to that goal configuration in a safe way. So what we have now here is some problems, examples where we have problems that have many different articulations. So the baby and the robot model there, they have the same type of skeletal structure, but they're different dimensions. And we fit some motion capture data, data from an actual box or to each of them. That's actually one of the easier problems on this slide here that moving that, uh, folding that soccer ball up into a ball shape, that's actually not very hard either, even though it has many different panels. The robot on the bottom left there, it's, that's a pretty tough problem because the robot needs to move its arm, grasp the binder, pick it up, and now move it safely over where it can drop it into the box. But the most difficult problem on this slide is actually the one that it's a little bit difficult to see, the one up here where it's this lamp, and there we have three different kind of chains that have to move together while maintaining the closure of those chains for all three while the lamp is moving. We'll talk a little bit later on about why that's hard, but that actually is the most difficult one on this slide, even though it might look to you to be one of the easiest. Next, here we have some examples where we have uh, the, mov the movable object can deform so here, the ducky and the teapot are following the same trajectory, and they're trying to avoid collision with those two bulbs, and they're following the same trajectory. Now, in this case, this has, there's essentially an infinite number of different ways that you could deform those objects to avoid the collision, and how you decide to do that would depend on the constraints of your problem. This is a, the same kind of application or need that's needed for during um, surgical planning. If you have like a needle that you need to insert into um, tissue, into a body, and avoid like some vital organs in order to reach the position where you need to extract tissue or deliver some kind of medicine or therapy. It's the same kind of problem there. The tissue is deformable. Next, we have some examples that come from intelligent computer-aided design. These are both examples that come from General Electric. Um, the, two, the one that's moving, this was something that a CAD designer sat in his office and he did, designed this part, but they didn't actually end up using it because they weren't able to determine in their testing capability whether or not it was possible to actually assemble it. So they knew that they would fit together in the assembled configuration, but they didn't know whether it would be possible to take the two parts and insert one into the other. So they went with another design. The other part over here, this is a blow up of this part here. This is part of an engine assembly. And they had a design constraint that this circled part here, and the, it's the green one here, they needed to be able to remove it without, you know, within a certain amount of time. So what the engineer did when they were designing this problem is you can see these pipes are bent a little bit. They did that because they thought the way that they would remove that particular part is they thought they would rotate it a bit and pull it out. 
it turned out using a motion planner that there was another trajectory, a removal trajectory that could have been found that didn't require them to have bent those pipes, which was something that you know, would have been more desirable for the design from the beginning. So these are two examples where had they had a motion planner integrated into the CAD system, that they would have been able to come up with better designs. In the first case, they would have been able to know that they could have used that design. And in the second case, they could have, would not have needed to bend those pipes. And you could imagine that you have this planner integrated into the system that would be also be very useful for training applications. You could have the mechanic. They might be outfitted with some VR headset where they could integrate the show them how to move the part with on, overlaid on the actual physical part of the part. So this would be better than you know, those schematic drawings where they have all those different layers that you see. OK, so, here's, so far, all the examples we've seen have had a single movable object. In these cases, we have multiple moving objects. The so one that's actually moving down here, there's a shepherd, and it's trying to herd these five little ducks into this corral. Now, those five little ducks, they don't actually know where they're trying to be corralled to. All they know is that they want to stay together and they want to avoid the shepherd. The shepherd is the one who has the knowledge about where he wants to send them. Um, the next ones, up here, this is a disassembly problem where they're first taking apart sub-assemblies and then moving them apart. And up here, we have a crowd simulation which was done in collaboration with some colleagues in architecture where they're interested in studying the exit strategies of individuals from a building. They may leave the building, then they collect to their vehicles in groups, and then they, they move out of the parking lot. But in this case, you have multiple moving agents that need to move, and so we need to do planning for each one of them individually as well as to avoid or move in coordinated fashion with other groups of agents. So finally, this example is a, quite a little bit different. So far, when we were talking about these um, motions, we were mostly um, interested in having validity that would avoid collision. Um, in the deformable objects, may there be some other constraints. But here, we are typically looking for configurations that meet other things. They, they do need to avoid collision, but there is also um, for a molecular motion, often we're looking for what's called low energy configurations because those would be more stable. Um, up here, the first example we have is a molecule docking. The green here is a drug molecule, and the red, white, and blue one is a protein surface. And the drug molecule needs to fit into a binding site on the surface of the protein. That's essentially kind of, a, imagine, a motion planning problem. The drug molecule needs to make its way to the protein surface and fit there. Um, these are two small proteins, and this is an RNA folding, and they need to, proteins as, go to a native, what's known to be their native state, and that's where they're active and, and perform their function. And one of the interesting things about them is they go always to this same particular native state. And so we're interested in studying these folding problems that could either predict where they, what that native state is, or how they may get there. Now these things, it turns out that we can, they're essentially the same kind of planning problem, but what we do is we replace that collision detection validity check with this energy computation. We'll talk a little bit about that more later. But basically, these are all different types of problems which we can solve with the same basic underlying motion planning algorithm. And that's what I would like to share with you today, is a little bit of a idea about how those work and how we might be able to apply them to all these different problems. And we do that using this concept called configuration space or C-space. And then I will give you a quick overview of a few different methods to see, so you can see how they work, and depending on how time works out, how we can apply them to a couple different cases. So first off, um, configuration space. This is a space which allows us to solve all those different problems that we saw using the same underlying method. So in this space, my robot, my movable object, maps to a point in this higher dimensional space. And I have what's called a parameter or a degree of freedom for each different aspect of that robot that I can control. And here's some examples along the bottom. So if my robot was just a point in three-dimensional space, that's a case where the workspace and the configuration space, the workspace where the robot actually lives, and the configuration space for this planning are the same. So if I know the x, y, and z coordinates of my point in the workspace, I also know the x, y, the point in configuration space. Now, if I have a rigid body in the workspace, 
So if you imagine that this point thing here was a rigid body, if I knew just the x, y, and z coordinates of one point of it, there are many different configurations of it. So I need three more values, the angular values, that tell me the orientation of that. So just a rigid object in three space has six degrees of freedom. This one here, um, this is like, imagine that that's in the plane of the screen. If I knew the alpha, beta, and gamma, those three angles, then I would know how that was coordinated and I could specify the configuration. This last one here is a protein. So in most, in many, it's a common application for modeling proteins that biologists and biochemists use, is they'll use two parameters, the phi psi angles for each amino acid in a protein that tells essentially how the, that one amino acid is kind of organized. A small protein might have 50 or 60 amino acids in it. So in that case, you would have 100 parameters or 100 dimensional space as a configuration space for this small protein. And that's how we use that. Now that's the configuration space. It doesn't say anything about whether or not those configurations are valid or not. For that, we now need to think about configuration space obstacles. That's where I take a point, the one configuration of my robot, and I evaluate it and decide whether or not it's, it's valid. So if I were the robot, I can only show you valid configurations of myself. But there would be a configuration of me where my arm would be through the podium. That would correspond to a point in the configuration space obstacle corresponding to the podium. And all the configurations where I would be in collision with the podium would correspond to the configuration space obstacle of the podium. And I could be simultaneously in collision with the podium and the stage. OK, I can't show you that either. But that would correspond to a point that was in simultaneously two configuration space obstacles. So that's basically all we need to know about planning to plan in configuration space. So now we can think about that. So motion planning in the workspace versus motion planning in configuration space. So in this case here, my robot is a triangle, and I want to move from the lower left of the workspace to up to the upper, no, lower right up to the upper left. And here's the corresponding version in configuration space. It's a three-dimensional configuration space instead of two dimensions, because I need the xy coordinate of one point of my triangle, and then the orientation. And essentially, you can imagine there's like one slice in that configuration space for each different orientation of the triangle. The, the kind of unpleasant part of this modeling is that I had these really nice, simple, rectangular workspace obstacles, and they now became these complicated objects in configuration space. But my planning is I had this slept volume in the workspace, and I always am going to have essentially a one-dimensional path in configuration space. And that's the scenario I have for all of the, ob like all the examples that we showed you. OK? So what about motion planning? Unfortunately, it turns out that pretty much any motion planning problem we'd actually be interested in solving is essentially considered to be intractable in the, in the common sense of computer science and tractability. The very best algorithm we have that's guaranteed to solve that problem always was an algorithm that was determined by John Canney in his PhD work back in 1986. And we can really only use it practically in cases up to four or five dimensions. So we can't even use it to plan in the general case for a rigid body in, in three space. But we still have to solve these problems, right? So what do we do? Is we turn to randomize or probabilistic methods when we want to solve these types of problems. And what we do is we trade off our guarantee that we're always going to have an exa uh, the exact answer for a method that works pretty well in most of the cases that we need. And there are essentially kind of two flavors of these types of methods that are in common use today. Um, and they depend on the scenario in which you're working. If you're working in a scenario where you know you are going to can put in some effort and map your space and you're going to use it again and again by the same robot, that's in this space that we call multi-query planning. And in that case, we can kind of build a map that we can reuse over and over again. The other option is single query planning, where you just are starting off and you want to have one particular query that you want to solve for that robot, and you use this single query method. Now, the, the example that I'm going to talk about today is the multi-query one, but essentially they, we use all the same types of primitive operations for both the single query and the multi-query, and so they work 
very much in the, in the same flavor. So now what I want to do is explain to you how this method works. So here's my simple example of configuration space. And in the roadmap construction phase, what we're going to do is we are going to randomly generate samples in my configuration space. And for each one, I'm going to evaluate whether or not it is valid. So in this example, I would maintain all the blue samples because they're valid, and the ones that land in a configuration space obstacle, which I will determine by testing collision detection in the workspace, say, I will discard them. Then, after I've done that, for each sample that I maintained, I'm going to try to make a connection to the nearby samples, a small number, fixed number. So in this case, I'm going to try to make a connection to four near my samples. And if these were the four that I tried, I was going to keep these three blue ones, and I'm going to discard the red one. And I will do that because what we will do is we will just check this straight line between the, the two that I'm trying to connect, and I will check along a particular resolution. And if any of them in that straight line are found to be invalid, I will discard the connection. Now, note that it doesn't mean that it's not possible to move from that point to that one. It certainly is, right? It just means that that particular way I tried to do it failed, and so I'm going to discard it. Now, I do this for all of them, and once I'm done, I now have my roadmap, which I can use for my query processing. So now it comes time for query, query processing. I have a start and goal configuration, and what I want to do is I'm going to try to connect them to that roadmap that I've already built, and then I'm going to use my favorite strategy for selecting a path in that graph. And if I would manage to connect both those start and the goal to the same component of my graph, then I'll find a path. Note that it's not the shortest path. It's not an optimal path. It's just a path. And that's often what we're looking for. So the great news about this, when these methods were first discovered, it was extremely revolutionary. They were able to, to solve problems that we had not been able to solve before very quickly. Um, they applied also easily to high dimensional space. So if you have a robot that has an arbitrary number of joints, you could apply the same method to it and it would work quite well and it didn't require a lot of extra work. So that was one of the really great breakthroughs of them. And essentially, we could solve a lot of problems we'd never been able to solve before. But if you've been thinking about this and looking at this, you probably imagine that there are some cases where you could think that it doesn't work very well. And that's the case. Um, for example, the, here's an example at the bottom where it would be difficult. That method wouldn't work very well if we're just doing uniform sa sampling into space. And the problem is there's some of these narrow regions that your, path, your roadmap would need to have paths through. And if you're just doing kind of random sampling of points, your probability of getting a point in those regions is very small. And that's essentially where the, group, the work of my group has concentrated over the past you know, many years, actually. And the, uh, think about a case where this is the case. If you have a, a task where the robot needs to touch something, this corresponds to being able, needing to plan on the surface of one of those configuration space obstacles. And if you could imagine, if you're just doing random sampling of your robot, the chance that I'm going to generate a, a configuration where I'm touching the surface and not in collision with it is essentially zero. Okay? And there are a lot of important applications of robotics where we need to have contact and touch things. So unless we do something smarter, we're not going to be able to use those methods in these cases. So it turns out um, there is kind of a nice way to do this, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that. So the kind of unfortunate thing, if we just apply these methods as you know, they originally thought about, that most of the samples aren't going to be where we need them. If I'm doing random sampling in this auditorium, I'll get samples up here on the stage, I'll get them in the aisles, but I'm not going to get them between the, the rows there because most of those will come up with collision. So I won't be able to use those. What we really would like is to have the samples that are near the surfaces. That's where the planning is difficult, right? So how do we do that? Well, we, unfortunately, we can't afford to construct those configuration space obstacles. That's part of our complexity. They're too complex for us to represent, so we can't afford to collect them, con uh, construct them. So we want to sample near them without having an explicit construction or representation of them. 
But we do have something that we haven't used. We have the description of our workspace. We do have the description of the chairs here in the auditorium and the stage and all that. So can we use that? Well, it turns out it's really pretty easy to do that. This was the very first work that my group did on this problem. So imagine you have a configuration space obstacle. I'm the robot. The configuration space obstacle is a podium. We generate a point that's in collision. Generate a configuration where I'm in collision with the podium. Now we select a random direction in configuration space, and we look for a free configuration in that direction. So now I'm the free configuration, say, in the direction. And once you're in this situation, we are home free. We can now do a bisection search. I generate the, point, the midpoint between these two, and it's in collision, so now I'm going to continue now between points two and three. We'll do it again. So point four, now it's free, so I'm going to continue again between points three and four. Do it again. Point five, it's free. Now I'm going to stop whenever I've decided I'm close enough, and that's something you get to decide as the one who designs the problem. So in this case, I might stop here. So that's essentially how we can generate points on the surface without having an explicit representation of the surface. One of the challenges here is this ray that we have, it intersects the surface in one, two, three, four, five points. I have no idea how many points it has intersected the surface. I have no idea which one I found. I just know I found one of them. And there is at least one if I have one point that's in collision and one that's not. But I can't say anything further, really. We've typically used heuristics to try to cover the configuration space obstacle surface nicely. That was one of the challenges that really bugged me for, I would say, 15 years. Um, how can we do something that will tell us how to sample that surface nicely? Well, it turns out it's actually pretty easy. I want to talk about that. So how can we generate samples uniformly on a surface without knowing where it is? OK. It turns out it's not hard. What we do here, instead of sampling points uniformly, what we do is we have fixed-sized line segments that we sample uniformly. So essentially, you're throwing, imagine you have a whole bunch of like, sticks that are all the same line, space. You throw them into your space. And now for each one of those, we're going to test all the, find all the points where it intersects the surface. It turns out we can prove that that will actually um, uniformly cover the surface of the, our surfaces, which is what we're looking for. Unfortunately, it's not very efficient. I wouldn't recommend you use it because if the stick is small, like close to a point, it basically does the same as our points. If the stick is very long, well, then it takes longer to check it because you have to check every single point along the stick. But it, it works nicely, and at least you could use this in the areas where if you really wanted to cover the surface nicely. Another um, uh, kind of question you might ask, or which we were asking, is can we reduce the dependence of the volume of the space on the sampling density? So this is the problem. You know, the smaller the volume of that narrow passage, the more samples you need to be sure that you actually got a point in it. So it turns out we can do this. Here's the problem, the kind of the, the thing that was bugging me for a very long time. There's two problems here. One on the left, there is actually a small narrow passage, and it's possible to move from the bottom to the top. The one on the right, it's totally blocked. It's not possible to move between the bottom and the top. How can we determine the difference between these two methods with this sampling strategy? Well, with that original method that we have, we really can't. We don't know. Now, what if you have another idea? What if instead of just mapping the free space, the white space there, we also map it the invalid space? So in that case, we have these two different pictures here, right? Um, and there is a difference. In particular, if you look at the maps of the block space, one of them has two different connected components, and one of them has just one. And if we have the two components here, at some point I might try to connect points that are in both of them, and I'll fail. When I fail, how did I know I failed? Because I found a point that was free in between them. Well, that's actually one of those tricky points that I wanted to find. That's one of those really special, important points that's in this narrow region. 
So I can actually keep that point and put it into the other space. So that ends up actually kind of solving that problem for us. Um, I don't want to go too much into this result here, but the main thing is I, to show you is I have three different passages. This passage three has a very narrow region, and passage one is pretty wide. And let's look at these red samples. This is the number of samples out of 1,000, and here's 450, that I ended up in the passage. And you see, yes, it went down when I got to that narrower region, but it's still an awful lot. It's about a third of my samples end up in that narrow region using that method. And so what this did is it's kind of threw out some of the standard theory we have for these these sampling-based methods that said the narrower the region, the more samples you need. In fact, in this case, it's not true. The narrower the region, it's actually not any harder. It's still pretty easy to solve using this strategy. So we kind of need to th rethink some of the, our traditional theory using this method. This is something we're still you know, trying to understand how best to use this. So now I just have a couple minutes left, so I think I'm just going to talk to you about the first one. Um, and this one is, so far I've really only been talking about fully automatic methods, things that we can do without using human insight. Now when you look at this problem, all of us look at this problem, we all know roughly what the solution path will look like. You know that it's going to be something like this, right? So the idea here is, can I use the human insight using something called a haptic device? This is a virtual reality device that gives you force feedback, and sketch a solution path and maybe it would be something similar to this that's pretty close to the solution, but it's not necessarily required to be. Maybe it's too difficult for me to do that as, as the human, but I can just kind of roughly sketch it. And then you ask the planner to fix this. Now you've actually made the problem easier for the planner because you've identified a region of the space that the planner needs to search, and you've told it the interesting area. And so now you can make this problem not be very difficult. And here's some example of what we were able to do using this strategy. On the bottom here, we have this flange problem. There's three different versions of it. The one is the original version. 0.95 and 0.85 means we shrunk that inner tube to be 95% or 85% of its original size. And in the 85% version of the size, so it was quite easy, um, we were able to solve it with our fully automatic method. And then we had this haptic method it took just a few seconds. That's the work of the planner. The planner attached it and then moved it out. The 0.95 version of the problem, I don't show the time that the fully automatic method would have taken. It would have, it would have solved it eventually, but it would have taken a long time. But this is the haptic one, the user collected path we gave it. The yellow one is the one I want to point out to you. This one is interesting. We took the solution path from the 0.85 version of the problem and used that as input to the 0.95 version of the problem. And that was faster, and the reason for that is because that path was closer, you know, it shared important characteristics of the solution path for the 0.95. And that's actually how we solved the original version of the problem. We took the solution path for the 0.95 version and passed it off to that. Now this example doesn't show that I needed humans, unfortunately, right? Because I could have taken the fully automatic one, original one, and passed that, kept improving that one. But, you know, I think that there's, you know, and there are some problems like that alpha puzzle I showed you originally. We can't use it to solve this method because we don't really know what it's like. But I think there's important issues here. But the bottom line is if we can kind of reduce the space that the planner needs to, to search, it'll work a lot better. Okay, so I think I need to finish now. I won't tell you about the protein folding. But the, that was an exciting a application. What I hope you're kind of left with is that there's an amazing diversity of problems. Anything that deals with a movable object, we can actually use these methods on. What you need to do is kind of understand how to define a configuration of your movable object and how to do this validity check for it. And then I must thank my students who really have done all the work and as well as my collaborators in different fields. Um, I'll just point out here, this was a high school student that worked with us. Um, he worked with us like three or four years ago. He won... A, national science competition, the Siemens competition in the US, and he got a $100,000 scholarship for college based on the work that he did with us. And he's the most famous version, uh, member of my group. He got, this is him in Times Square, and that's himself on the Times Square reader board. So he's standing there and he has a picture. So I have not yet reached that um, amount of fame, but <laughs> 
it's possible. So um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Hello. Yeah, have you considered, um, well, have you looked into heuristics or generating heuristics out of these um, spaces, the search spaces? Of the spaces or, well, we use heuristics a lot for, um, I, di I didn't talk really about, but most of these methods we actually use heuristics a lot to, for example, the original one, when we're trying to select the the object that we want to start off in collision with, we will select parts of an object based on its surface area, for example. Um, we would apply heuristics and, and machine learning methods often to identify what region of the space we want to work in next. We use um, heuristics or machine learning to decide which variant of the sampling strategy I should use at this particular point in my case. So there's a lot of tuning that we need, both in the selection of what particular strategy we want to use, as well as the parameters for those strategies. Any other question? I think there's a hand back there, way back there. Um, so, in the triangle navigating the blocks example you had, um, how do you represent the, f let, let's assume the triangle can't strafe sideways, it has to always travel in the direction it's pointing. How do you um, construct in the C space the, um, the restrictions in the state transition? So, it's not allowed to strafe, it's not allowed to do any other kind of strange movements. So, that would be more of the, this, um, you know, single query strategy, we'd use a method called um, RRT, perhaps, and that's where your next step is going to be determined based on your current position, trajectory, heading, dynamics, et cetera, things like that. But the, the version that I talked about here, where we're just doing sampling in the entire space, it doesn't really, you, you could try to apply that when you're doing this so-called local planning, but uh, it would be more appropriate to use that single query variant of these methods in that case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you.